It's a new day in Zion at the Towers of the Virgin. Still so much to see. Unfortunately, we're on a schedule. The Union Pacific buses would be leaving shortly after breakfast. We also have time for me to go retry a photo from a few years ago that didn't turn out quite the way I wanted. The Mount Carmel Highway climbs the canyon floor up to the famous tunnel on its way to the east entrance and passes over a bridge millions cross but few ever see. The bridge was built by local stonemasons from the town of Springville using rock quarried locally. A work of art in itself made by the people who obviously loved the park they had grown up in. But coupled with the morning light it becomes a gorgeous portal looking into the canyon. I like to think of it as the Eye of Zion. Also in the water, more wildlife. Tadpoles in the desert. We won't be taking the tunnel this trip because as, as of 1926, it wasn't built yet. Its construction was to allow easier access between Zion and Bryce specifically for the Union Pacific tours and the many tourists who visited Zion and Bryce as a pair. In fact, early National Park Service info booklets just grouped the two together. Instead, we head south past Smithsonian Butte. On the way out, we cross Rockville Bridge, built specifically by the Park Service to assist tourists and benefit the town in the process. But this, and the Mount Carmel Tunnel, show that besides being a part of the town's economy, or in the case of some towns like Springville, all of their economy, the parks also benefit rural areas with infrastructure improvements. going up that. It looks like a few people making the trek in 1916 left their mark using axle grease. The trip across the south of Grand Staircase to Pipe Springs is long and dry. Back in 1926, these dirt roads were more representative of the roads than compared to the paved comforts we have now. In fact, I planned this trip to be as accurate to the Union Pacific tour as possible, down to the hour. The difference is that what was once a 9 hour drive back then is only a 4 hour drive according to Google Maps. But this would have made for a whirlwind tour for tourists back then, spending more time traveling between parks than waking hours actually spent in the parks. Ignoring time spent asleep, here's how much actual time the official tour allows early tourists for each park along the way. So if you ever see a big tour bus pull up to an overlook, tourists spill out and swarm all over taking pictures, then they all stream back into the bus and leave all in about 30 minutes? Remember that that's not a horrible new trend in the Disneylandification of the national parks. That's actually more true to the original way tourists visited the parks and dates all the way back to their inception. So this trip is ending up being like one of those whirlwind trips. Personally, I'm a staunch believer in spending more time in individual parks than trying to just hit them all at once. But at the same time, seeing them all like this as a whirlwind is just as a magical experience and leaves me wanting more. All of the time I see people like myself demonizing others who plan to visit five parks in five days. But you know what? Not everybody has unlimited time and funds to spend two weeks at every park. It's hard to get a bunch of days off work, and then to get those days to match with when the kids are out of school and to save up enough money to cross the country to do it. If you only have enough time to cram them all into one trip, do it. It's still better than not seeing them at all. That being said, if possible, try to take this Union Pacific tour and spread it out over a week or two, or try to divide it up into two or three smaller five-day tours if you can. And for God's sake, spend more time than 30 minutes at Cedar Breaks. It's an overlooked gem and one of the easily the best parks to really make your own. Pipe Springs is more of a historic site than a natural feature, but you can see the history of Mormon pioneers as the first people of European descent settling the land, and the natives that were here before, during, and still here now managing the monument. With the springs a source of year-round water, it made the area an early hub of activity. Even now it's very much an oasis in the desert. There were lots of dragonflies and even salamanders in the water.
pipe spring sits at the foot of the Vermilion Cliff step in the Grand Staircase. As we start to climb up the Kaibab Plateau, we can look back and see the entire staircase. John Wesley Powell named it the Grand Staircase for the way successive cliff rock layers step down towards the Grand Canyon. At the time of his surveys, this was the last blank section of the map of the United States. The top of the staircase is Bryce Canyon, and from here we can see Yovimpa Point, our destination's about two days from now. It's great to see all the cliffs of the staircase at once. Pink, gray, white, vermilion, and chocolate. After the last couple days of hot desert terrain, we're suddenly in a pine tree forest. Kaibab Plateau was set aside by Theodore Roosevelt as a wildlife preserve. Although Roosevelt was an avid hunter, he was also an avid conservationist, as contrary as that sounds now. He had seen the near extinction of the American bison and knew that hunters won't have anything to hunt if they don't also preserve and protect the land that the animals need to live and thrive. Being a natural forest, the use of the land management is a bit different than the parks as well. Without spending 10 minutes on it, the simple description is that both were created with protection in mind, but the national forests were to be maintained and used as a renewable resource. The national parks were to be left as natural and wild as possible, man would try to keep their hands off as much as they could. There's still an old lookout tower here that's used for fire watching. It was built in 1934, but that's close enough to the Union Pacific tour timeline that I decided to take a look. And enjoy the nice view from almost the top of the tower. This area all had a fire run through it in 2006. So, what are we at, 13 years? Look at all those aspens in 13 years. Kaibab Plateau is exactly what the name suggests, a high altitude plateau that gives the feel of being in the mountains with much more flat top terrain. The alpine flora and fauna are a large difference from the hotter deserts surrounding it. You can see why Roosevelt saw the benefit of making it a biological preserve. These large mountain meadows that early visitors referred to as parks are prime locations for viewing wildlife. Unlike the last few years when Zion stole its place for higher visitation, through the 20th century, the Grand Canyon was the highlight of a tour through the national parks. It makes me wonder if the tourists stopped at the VT Park Tourist Ranch back in 1926 were excited at the anticipation of finally seeing the Grand Canyon tomorrow, or if they enjoyed the moment and took in the peacefulness of the forest. The lodge that sits where our original tour would have camped was still closed for the year, so we snuck off a side road to do some dispersed camping near an overlook of the eastern Grand Canyon area. For me, it's a little apprehension of leaving the quiet solitude of the forest and going back into the crowds of the parks. Although, maybe, perhaps not. I still enjoyed Zion as it was crowded. Maybe another miracle will happen. <laughs> 